Good morning once again. It is good to see that even more of you have come in. Welcome to church. And uh, just uh, do me a favor, turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 21. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our time for the rest of this afternoon. Um, 1 Kings chapter 21. When you are there, say amen. Cool. So as we're looking for that, 1 Kings chapter 21, I just want to ask a question. You see, obviously, the title is When the Grass Seems Greener. Most of you are very aware of the saying, um, the grass seems greener on the other side of the fence. And it got me thinking. Um, and I wanted to ask, is there anybody here that greatly enjoys lawn care? To see a couple hands, there were a couple um, first service as well. I saw my dad's hand go up. I'm glad you're here, Dad, um, because you're the illustration this morning. Um, growing up, I noticed my dad loved to take care of the lawn, right? Um, how many of you can say that you enjoy a nice, plush, you know, green lawn in your front yard or backyard? How many of you would enjoy having that? Right? And there's some of us that enjoy having that, and there's some of us that enjoy creating that or maintaining that. My father is one of them. Um, he loves it so much that his yard is only so large, and he eventually runs out of grass to take care of. So he comes to my house. And I have a, I have a relatively big backyard. It's probably about the depth of, of the sanctuary. It's not as wide as the sanctuary, but it's a, it's, it's a pretty big area, um, and I'm the only one on my street left that has any hedges, and I'm pretty sure it's just because he likes taking care of hedges. And then when my yard is done, he'll, when those lawns have been used up, he will then make the journey across town and, and go to my brother's house. And we all appreciate the work that he puts in. My lawn looks very good, and it's not because I'm good at it. Um, and I remember growing up, you know, I wasn't allowed to, to mow the lawn. And at first, I thought it was because, you know, it was a safety thing, and he was like, no, you know, you might cut off your foot or something like that. But I just realized it wasn't him protecting me. It was him protecting the lawn. <laughs> because... I could cut everybody else's grass. That's how I made money as a kid, basically going along and cutting grass, but not at my house. Why? Because that was the arena, that was the sanctuary for my dad. And so for some of you that are, you know, super into that, you take this literally, right? And you see, you drive down the road, and you drive down, and you see, and you can grade the amount, you know, the, the thickness of the grass. You know, that's a good lawn. Oh, they need work. Some of you probably know the different types of grass. Some of you, you know, are on the first name basis at, at Home Depot or Lowe's with the garden center people or Walmart for the rest of us. And you understand that sometimes it's easy to look at someone else's lawn and say, wow, I wish my lawn was like their lawn. I wish my grass was like their grass. The thing is, for most of us, myself included, We can't really take it literally. However, it's a symbolic thing. The idea that sometimes when we look out of ourselves and we look at other people, and in today's world it's extremely easy, right? Because if you're on Facebook or, or any other social media type of thing, you know, Instagram or Twitter, everyone's always posting their lawn, right? Everyone's always posting their life. And sometimes it's really easy to look out and see, wow, the grass seems so much greener over there. If only my life was like that. And it's... It's something that's becoming an issue in our society. And that's why today is so important. That's why this weekend is so important. Yes, Thanksgiving is a time to eat a ton of food. I plan to go to every family meal possible and eat all the food that I can't cook for myself. Right? And I thank the Lord for each of you that are gracious enough to be the cooks at your family dinners. God bless you. Because we would be very hungry without you. But it's not just a time, you know, to come together and eat. It's not just a time to come together as family. It's a time 
that the name itself fights against this concept. The idea of being thankful. The idea of thanksgiving. The idea of gratitude. And so what I want to do is spend a little bit of time in 1 Kings 21. And we're going to read through a story. We're going to look at different aspects of the story to encourage us about the importance of taking this weekend and turning it from a one you know, holiday Monday type of deal to an everyday lifestyle of thanksgiving. And so let's pray and then we'll get into the word. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for everything that you do for us. And I just pray that as, as I speak, Lord, uh, that the words that I speak will be translated through the Holy Spirit and that everyone will hear what they need to hear. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 1 Kings 21. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use as a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or, if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. <coughs> and so a lot of times when you say all these names, every time I do a Bible study, it's always funny, because you read through, especially if you're reading through like Joshua, or, or some of those places where they list off all the names, and, and you hear these locations, and sometimes it's, it's hard to figure out, you know, what are they talking about? And so what I did is, through the shapes function on Microsoft Word, because I do not have any Photoshop skills, I have put on some little location markers here. And so if you look at the orange location marker, that is Jericho. Okay, so that's where the walls came down. You see that the blue or the purpley area is Judah, green part is Israel, right? For any of you that might be confused, thought they were the same thing, um, after Solomon, they split. And so we're ha this is happening some years after Solomon. And so Jerusalem is in blue, right? So that's that little area down there. Samaria, which is the capital of the northern uh, nation of Israel, is right there. And Jezreel, where our story takes place, is this red one up here pointing right there. And so that's where everything is happening. Jezreel is kind of in the north. It's close to the Sea of Galilee. And basically, Ahab has seen that there is a vineyard near his palace, and he wants it. And so he goes, and he tells Naboth, I want your vineyard. You know, I'll pay you for it. I'll give you another vineyard. You know, can I have it? And <coughs> what I want to do is start out by looking at some of the reactions that we have in this text. Because I love kind of observing human behavior. And sometimes the way people react to things not only tell you about the person, but can also give you a lesson about yourself. And so we're going to look at the various characters in this story. How do they react to what is happening? And the first one is Naboth, right? King of Israel comes in and says, hey, I want your vineyard. You know, what do you want for it? And Naboth says in verse 3, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. Naboth has had that land in his family since they divided up the, ki the kingdom when they first entered the promised land. And he says, you know, the inheritance, this is part of my family. I would be disrespectful to them. I'm not going to give it up, right? He is going to hold on to it like that little boy is holding on to that sand. Some of you can't see it. Some of you have no idea what that picture is. Other people will get it. So Naboth... He's holding on. He's staying firm. Uh, the king of Israel says, hey, I want your land. And he says, no. Because to him, what God has given him is important. Then we move on to Ahab. Verse 4. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. Have you ever met somebody that is dramatic? Everyone that has, a t every, all the parents that have a teenager are, like, are nodding their heads, looking around to see if they can find their kid. Um, this was me. 
This is me. My brother was, my younger brother was the one who threw tantrums. My older brother was so much older, I don't know how he responded as a kid because he was a grown man when I was a kid. But my younger brother, he would throw tantrums, right? So he doesn't get what he wants. Things are flying, you know, he's running around yelling and screaming and doing all that stuff. I was the exact opposite. You know, I want something, I want that. No, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> right, I was the powder, I was the sulker. And so this, you know, this is something that kind of hits home for me. But when you look at Ahab's response, Ahab's response comes from a completely emotional, um, I guess, foundation. Right? And one of the things when we, when we talk about Thanksgiving and stuff, one of the pitfalls that we run into sometimes is that when we don't get what we want, we respond with a 100% emotional reaction. Right? And, and you've seen that. You know, anyone that has been a teenager, had a teenager, and quite frankly, I... I don't want to pick on the teenagers because as adults, we have a lot of these same tendencies, right? We just do it slightly more private, hopefully. And so Ahab is here and he has reacted. He did not get what he wants and so he reacts like a child and he is sulking and he is refusing to eat. You have to be pretty upset to not eat. When I'm upset, I want to eat. But he's on that next level where he's saying, no, 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 I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to get out of bed. The world is over because I'm not getting my vineyard. The next person in this story that we encounter and her reaction is Jezebel. Verse 5 to 8 says, His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? Have you ever had your spouse, you know, ask you, What's wrong with you? Some of, some of your spouses might be nicer than mine and, and might say it in a, you know, honey, are you okay? But usually it's the same thing. It's like, what is, what is wrong with you? Um, or maybe, maybe it's just me. I'm sorry. But verse 6, he answered her, because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in his place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. It's almost like a mother talking to, like, a child. Ahab why are you upset? <laughs> he won't give me the <laughs> vineyard, right? He doesn't want to share, right? It's going into this thing. And so Jezebel, like so many other times when us men tend to be a little, I gotta be careful in this one, less than adulty, um, she decides that she's gonna take action. And so Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Right? She's like, you have to remember, you are a grown man, and you are the king of a nation. Right? But she still doesn't, she still says, but just like a lot of other situations, I'll do it. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city. Whereas Ahab takes a completely emotional response and withdraws, which is also bad, Jezebel then goes ahead and it leads to immediate action, which is not always good either. But what we learn from this encounter is the fact is, if we are not willing to do what we need to do, and I'm not justifying anything that Ahab is doing, but if we respond to negativity with more negativity and we decide to quit or be inactive, what we do is then we give the power for somebody else to act on our behalf. And then we have to deal with the fact that it might not be us making that decision. And so when we can't respond to something thoughtfully, what happens is we let somebody else respond for us. And we give away a lot of power that God has given us to exercise our own actions. This is what she wrote. Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people, but seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him 
to death. A lot of times we look at this, and Jezebel is well known in the Bible, right? She's the one that threatens Elijah. Um, she's the one that has a very gruesome death. Jezebel is kind of a name synonymous with someone you shouldn't listen to, right? Almost the ultimate expression of when you give too much influence to your spouse and when you give too little influence to God. But what's funny is when you look at this, it sounds a lot like another letter. Ahab was a bad king. Every single king uh, from, you know, from Jeroboam all the way down to the last king of Israel when they were wiped out by Assyria, every single king in the northern kingdom is said to have been a bad king, is said to have been a king that did not follow God. But it's interesting that this letter sounds so much like a letter written by one of the ones we call a good king. And if you remember, David also had a little bit of an issue. He also saw the grass was greener somewhere else. He also saw something that did not belong to him that he wanted. And he wrote a letter, right? She's writing a letter basically sealing Naboth's death. And David writes a letter saying, put Uriah at the front of the battle where he is sure to be killed. And so what's interesting is it doesn't matter what your background is, whether you started off as a good person or a bad person, if you do not react maturely to the th get, not getting the things that you want, other people suffer. And so we get to the next group of people that we're going to analyze a little bit, and that is the people in Jezreel. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city, this is verse 11 to 13, did as Jezebel directed in the letter she had written to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. What is amazing to me in this, in this passage is right here, this is their accusation. Naboth has cursed both God and king. Period. End of quotation. Next sentence. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. That's a quick reaction. That is a quick reaction, an emotional reaction, and a fear reaction obviously because it's coming from the queen. But that is a sheep reaction. The sheep go wherever the rest of the sheep are going. And the thing that we have to learn from the people of Jezreel's response and their reaction is that we... Oh, i got to be careful because technically we are called sheep. Know who your shepherd is. Let's put it that way. Right? In the context of the social world and the culture that we live in, don't just be a sheep. Because what happens is, and I see this all the time, whether it's you know, on, on social, various social media platforms or just talking to people, it's amazing how someone will read something and immediately that is the gospel truth. Because they saw a picture with some words put on it and an angry face, they you know, they're going to go and we don't fact check things anymore. We don't, you know, we hear something about someone in the church. We don't give them the benefit of the doubt. We just share the information. And what happens is here is as someone comes up, Naboth is an innocent man. And his only problem is being in close proximity to an evil man. And so many times... Innocent people are destroyed because we don't take the time to make informed decisions. Someone comes up and says, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. And everyone's like, oh, we got to kill him then. One period separates, I was trying to say represent and separate at the same time, separates the accusation and the punishment. And God has taught us to be patient and to be thoughtful, right? And so we learn from their reaction. And then we enter the final character of, of, our, little, of our story, and that is Elijah. And Elijah is not impressed. What happens is, they, as soon as they kill Naboth, they send word to Jezebel and they say, 
It's done, we've killed him. Jezebel informs Ahab, who gets up off his bed, and goes and enjoys the vineyard. While this is happening, God is speaking to Elijah. And he says, Then the Lord of the word, then the Lord, the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, <coughs> This is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, This is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. If I'm Ahab, he's already, you've already seen that he's an emotional guy, but he has been through a roller coaster, right? He's king of Samaria, yay. He sees this vineyard, he's like, oh, there's this awesome vineyard, it's right by my palace, this is gonna be so great. I'm gonna go talk to that guy, I'll go offer him a bigger vineyard, everything's gonna be good. Then all of a sudden Naboth says no, and now he's crying on his bed, right? He's not eating. And then his wife is kind of, you know, on his case about it, which probably doesn't help your emotions, I'm guessing. And all of a sudden, he now has his vineyard. And now he's riding this, this emotional high that I have my vineyard, right? He's already in the vineyard walking around being like, oh, I'm going to put some tomatoes there. And I'm going to do this. And now Elijah comes in and ends the sentence with, the dogs will lick up your blood. And the thing is, when you can't get in control of that, this pattern kind of just continues. Right? Because in gratitude, right, Ahab was not grateful for the things that he had. He wanted more. Ingratitude leads to covetousness. Covetousness then leads on to unhappiness. Unhappiness leads to dark thoughts. Dark thoughts, if left unchecked, lead to evil actions, and evil actions lead to a bad ending. It all starts with being grateful. A lot of the problems we face in the world, world hunger, the slavery, all sorts of evils that are done would be completely gone if everyone was just happy with what they had. So, obviously we don't want to fall into that trap, right? We see Ahab, he was a bad king. What's actually interesting about Ahab though is when Elijah says this to Ahab, he actually repents. And he comes in and he, you know, he apologizes. And God actually tells Elijah, see how Ahab has repented. Because he has, I will not bring the calamity on him. I will save it for his children. Which still isn't a great thing. But it just shows, it doesn't matter how messed up you are, God's grace is amazing. Ahab is listed as one of the worst kings to ever lead Israel, and yet when he turned to God, actually multiple times, this happened before, when he turned back to God, God was gracious. And so for us, that's one of the things I'm super thankful for. Because whether you are, think you're a good person or a bad person, we have all made mistakes, and I am so glad to praise God this morning that he is gracious. So obviously we want to avoid this. And so we look at the flip side of it, thankfulness. Being thankful guards against covetousness, right, or greed. A lack of covetousness leads to appreciation for the things you already have. An appreciative life, appreciation leads to joy. Joy creates good thoughts, and good Christ-like thoughts lead to Christ-like action. And Christ-like thought and action leads to a very, very, very beautiful ending. Technically, it never ends. It's called eternal life. But the idea is that we can go down these paths. We can look at these stories in the Bible. And we talked about this last night at the first Friday. The Bible shows a lot of different things. One thing it shows the immense grace and the awesomeness of God, but the other side, it shows the path and the human capacity for evil when we walk the other direction. And so sometimes we have to choose, am I going to walk a direction of gratitude or am I going to walk a direction 
of it is not enough. A very rich person, who I feel like would have some insight into these things, said, be thankful for what you have. You'll end up having more. If you concentrate on what you don't have, you will never, ever have enough. Someone much richer and much more famous, Jesus in Luke 12, verse 15 said, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. You study the Bible and you realize more and more that life does not, is not made up of what you have, where you go, what position you hold. Life is found in Jesus Christ and life more abundantly. And so, being thankful 101. Very simple. I'm not reinventing the wheel. It starts with remembering what God has done. When you stop and you pay attention to the things that God has done, you start to realize, wow, he's been active. Wow, he's been there. And you start to trust that he can do it again. And so what I want to do is just really quickly, I'm sure that you can't list everything, but in your own personal reflection, just for a minute or so, um, you can close your eyes, but looking at some of you, it's probably not a good idea. Um, if you close your eyes, you might never come back. But for the rest of you, take some time, and within your own heart, it can be a, a list form, you can do it in a prayer, but remember what God has done for you. It could have been today, it could be simply the fact that your pew didn't fall down. Right? There, you have already have one. But think about and remember what God has done for you. I'm just going to give you a couple, a, a short period for that. Do that now. All right. Did anyone get to five? Raise your hand if you got to five things. Did anyone get past ten? It was a very short amount of time. Good. If you didn't make it to ten, that is your homework for the rest of Sabbath. Make it to ten. This is important because the opposite of remembering is what? Forgetting. And it is very rare that forgetting leads to a good feeling. Right? I'm not saying feelings are the end-all be-all, but I remember getting in my car and driving down the 401 and, and sitting in that DVP to Allen parking lot for a little while and getting up to the church and walking up to the church, to the church doors and reaching in for my keys and realizing that I was in Toronto, I was in North York, and my keys were hanging on the hook in Oshawa. I had forgotten them, and I didn't like that. And many of you have forgotten things, right? Oh, I forgot I had a test today for some of the students. Or, oh, that was due today. Or, oh, it's our anniversary. Um, you know, or various other things. You forget, you know, your child's name sometimes, right? They said there's a correlation between how many you have, right? If you have one, you're going to get it right every single time. The higher you go, the lower it drops. Um, <coughs> you know... When we forget things, it usually leads you know, to a bad thing. So we want to remember. It's the same thing with, with God. It's the same thing with our spiritual life. When we forget, bad things happen. Because when you look at, at uh, Ahab, the very first thing is Ahab forgot that he didn't deserve any land in the first place. If you go back a chapter to 1 Kings 20, it reads this, 1 to 5. Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, uh, Syria, mustered his entire army accompanied by 32 kings with their horses and chariots, he went up and besieged Samaria, which is the capital of, of Israel, and attacked it. He sent messengers into the city to, to Ahab, king of Israel, saying, this is what Ben-Hadad says. Verse 3, your silver and gold are mine, and the best of your wives and children are mine. 
The king of Israel answered, Just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I have are yours. The following verses shows that even though Ahab had given up on his people, that God hadn't. And God wins a major decisive victory for Israel. But then, at the end of the same chapter, the next spring, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. When the Israelites were also mustered and given provisions, they marched out to meet them. The Israelites camped opposite them like two small flocks of goats, while the Arameans covered the countryside. You know what happened? God happened. And that group covering the countryside was thoroughly defeated by two small flocks of goats that were the Israelite army. Twice, leading up to this story, twice Ahab should have had everything he owned, including his life, ripped from him by the Syrians. And twice God intervened and gave him victory. Victory that he did not deserve. He shouldn't have even had a country to plant a vineyard in. But the other thing is, is that Ahab forgot that he didn't deserve the rain that made the vineyard appealing. Ahab, for those of you who are still making some of the connections, he is the evil king during the time of Elijah and the Mount Carmel fire from heaven experience. And so when you get there, um, the, short, the short version is, Elijah showed up. The first time he is introduced in the Bible, Elijah shows up, goes to the king of Israel, and says, the Lord says there will be no rain until I say it will rain. Then he walks away. That's an entrance. And so they've had a long time, right? Three years of drought, of famine. And after a long time, verse 1 to 2, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe. For any of the kids that might not know what a famine is, a famine is when there's no water and nothing can grow, right? It's when it's the time when all of your grass is brown. They have the whole Mount Carmel experience, and then in 41, after Elijah has won, he says to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Ahab, being an evil king, had literally led to the point where nothing would have even grown in that vineyard. The only reason the vineyard was even appealing was because God had been gracious to him, but Ahab forgot. Ahab also forgot that God had given him so much already. It's amazing when you want something that you don't have, how easy it is to forget what you do have. I mean, let's look at it. I want to look at verse 3 and verse 1, and I want to look at verse 3 first. Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. This was the little portion of Israel that belonged to Naboth. Sometime later, verse 1, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel close to the palace of the king of Samaria. And I watched, I bolded it, I underlined it, I'm using my green pointer thing, and I'm circling these two words. Why? Because Ahab was the king of Samaria, which meant he had a huge palace and land, and I'm sure many vineyards in Samaria. Jezreel was another place that he happened to live where he had another palace. Naboth had a vineyard. Ahab had already been given the keys to the kingdom. But he forgot what he had and he got so focused on what he didn't have. And I like Naboth. I like, you know, what he says. Because the thing with Naboth's inheritance is that when they were dividing up stuff, God put in place a plan, a lo location for the people of Israel. And this inheritance, this land, was part of the plan for Naboth's family. And God does the same thing for us. There is a plan, there is a, I guess you could say, a lawn, and I'm not talking about your physical house or your job, or, I'm talking about your life. And the plan and the, and the, 
the lawn that God has set up for you. And sometimes it's very easy to, to lose track of the blessings that God has given me in my yard and start looking at other people and starting to want what their inheritance is. The problem is that vineyard was not Ahab's inheritance. It was Naboth's. And when we get to our scripture reading, you know, this is a, it's a New Testament concept as well. <coughs> Peter has had a very emotional thing, right? Just like Ahab, Peter was a very emotional guy. And he had had a lot of ups and downs leading to our scripture reading in John 21, which interestingly is also the, cha the 21st chapter, which I just realized. It's cool how the Bible lines up sometimes. Peter has gone from being a fisherman to being a disciple of one of the, the most famous rabbi in the entire land to having Jesus say things like, you, are, you have been showed this by the Lord to the next thing saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Um, he has gone from proclaiming that he will never, regardless of whoever does what, he will never betray or abandon Jesus. And then like that night, he abandons Jesus. And then Jesus comes back. And we have here is that this is after the, the do you love me conversation. So Jesus has already asked him three times, do you love me? And he has redeemed Peter for each of his betrayals, for each of his denials. And Peter now, after that, hears from Jesus. So that's good. I'm on, I'm on this, I'm on this, you know, this up, upward trend. And then Jesus says, by the way, you're going to be martyred. Right? And he explains the way that he's, that he's going to die. And, and so it, with that in mind, Peter starts, Peter turned, verse 20, and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. The thing is, is that when we get caught up in someone else's life, we miss out on the blessings and the plan that God has given us for our life. And I'm not saying that your life will be easy. I'm not saying, you know, objectively from a worldly standpoint, yes, some people will live better lives. That is just the unfairness of sin. But what I'm saying is that God has an inheritance for you. God has a journey for you. God has a lawn and a spiritual yard for you. And actually, I added this last verse after last night's First Friday. We were talking about some of our favorite verses, and Larnell uh, Gutu actually brought up this one. And it really stuck with me, and it fit. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And what's interesting about this is Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah had a tough life. And God is talking to Jeremiah. He says, you know, I know the plans for you, plans to prosper you and to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And we claim that, but we have to remember that the plan for me is not the same as the plan for you or the plan for you or the plan for you. The yard that you've been given might not be the same shape, might not have the same type of grass, but it's yours. And it was given to you by God. And the beautiful thing about this is because I'm, I'm not trying to belittle our struggles because I realize there are people that have struggled and I wish that they hadn't had to have that struggle. But the thing you have to remember, and this is what I'm super thankful for, this is the, the hope that brings thanksgiving, is the fact that the yard that you've been given, the grass that you now take care of, it is not your final yard. It is not, God has a new lawn, a new setup for you when he makes the earth new. And we cling to that promise and we cling to that. And what that does is it helps us deal with the yard we have now because many of you have heard the grass, the grass always seems greener on the other side of the fence. But there's another quote that I've always, that's always stuck with me. It says, the grass is greener where you water it. Being thankful gratefulness, gratitude, thanksgiving. That is how you water the lawn that you have. When I drive down the street and I see people's lawns and they're really, really nice, you know what I realized after seeing 
the labor that my dad puts in, those lawns don't show up by the person sitting back and watching and complaining. Those lawns grow because someone, and I'm, a, I'm well aware sometimes we pay people for that, but because someone puts in the time to water it, to mow it, to put in those fancy looking rocks that kind of shape it and stuff, you know, to edge it, to do all of those things. Some people are down there with scissors cutting in around their flower pots. The reality is, is that any lawn can look beautiful if you're willing to invest in it. And our life, when we invest gratitude, when we put thanksgiving into our yard, what it does is it transforms the way we see our grass. And so my challenge to you is to take the concept of this weekend and to apply it to your life on a daily basis. Remember what God does for you. Look for the new things that God is doing for you. Don't compare yourself to what somebody else's plan is. And one day we'll all stand in our brand new lawn in heaven and then the earth made new and we will praise God for what he has given us. Let's start practicing that while we're still down here. I invite you to stand as we, uh, we close with our song. And I want you to focus on the words. There's a lot of things the world offers, but at the end of the day, our joy, our thanksgiving, our happiness is found in Christ.